Hello everyone. Welcome to Crafty Hand Studio Backstage. Hello and welcome to part two of our Seven Chorales by Johann Sebastian Bach. The first thing I had to do when I decided to tackle this project was find a score for it and I was able to find an arrangement online for four parts already scored for saxophone. And the arranger had conveniently provided a MIDI file which sounds kind of hokey. I'll play a little of it for you and you will notice that there are some breaks all cut up in here. Now each time you're hearing one of those breaks is where in the score there's a fermata. Now normally there's a conductor who will hold the note out at each fermata for an appropriate length of time, what sounds good, and then we'll have the band or the quartet continue. Since I want to play along with myself in this, I definitely needed a click track, so I decided to establish a time signature change that would represent the conductor holding the notes out. And what I did was I blew up the MIDI file as my guide track. And each place where there was a fermata to hold out the note, I cut it and then moved it over and then created a time signature track that would match the holds that I had represented down here. So it seems I'm destined to have oddball time signatures even playing Bach. You can see there's some measures of 7-4 thrown in. I determined that each hold given an extra three beats represented an appropriate hold and sounded good to me. So there's the entire project timeline with all the time signature changes for each of the seven corrals and I have them set up with markers here and I did them in a linear fashion. There was also a tempo track because each of the corrals has its own recommended tempo. So you can see the automation here that will change the clicks to the appropriate time signature, or tempo rather. And here's the sound of the click that I used. Pretty much a standard click. Turn that off. Okay, now in our previous video, with the leaving project, we used virtual instruments and didn't have any microphones involved or any input from uh, the console behind me, the SX-1. Since we're recording saxophones, we're going to be using audio. So first thing you do is, in the project, we add audio tracks. And I made them mono. Here, for example, is the baritone sax bell mic, and just below it, baritone sax side mic. I use two microphones on saxophones to capture the sound properly. Now, each of these audio channels is assigned, oops, 
and input. I have 16 ADAT channels coming in from the SX1. The first channel is called mono in, it doesn't say one. And then the rest are mono in 2, 3, etc., through mono in 16. So I'm using mono in 1 and 2. So the bell mic is always 1, and the side mic is always mono in 2. And I use the same combination for the tenor sax, bell and side, the alto sax, bell and side, and the soprano, bell and side. You see there's a third track down here. Once I had recorded the saxophone part, I combined it by bouncing the two tracks into a single, into a single channel with both mics blended together. And the reason I did this was so that I could work with the uh, editing a lot easier. I also used a technique with lanes. Let's open a lane here. And you can see that there are, well actually there's only one here. Let's see, uh, because I bounced it after they had been combined. So let's look at an original take. Now you can see these are the different takes. So on the baritone sax, I played through this as it looped three separate times. So we can blow these up, have a better look at them. Also change the view this direction so we can see some of the waveforms going on. Find a happy home for this transport here. Let's put it up top. So here's the master track, and then the three lanes show each of the takes. And then you can see these are all sliced up too. Because one of the first editing tasks was to get the beats lined up properly with the clicks so that I would be able to get all four parts once they were comped together to line up and be tight. So I sliced them up at the beginning of each event and then juggled them around. And also by slicing them, you're able to choose different notes from different takes and comp them together into what's sometimes referred to as a Frankenstein take. So some notes just sound better. Some are a little out of tune. Some are attacked better. Some are held out differently. So you, what you do is you loop this. You go through just listening over and over and over to the little sections and you choose the best note by note and put together your comp track and that track is then bounced to the combined mic track for the berry which looks like this it's also it's contiguous audio at this point one more operation then would take the berry combined microphones and then i would run it through a tuning or pitch correction plug-in. I only went to 50% tolerance on it. I don't like it to sound exactly perfectly in tune. I like it to still be a little bit human. And then those tuned tracks I bounced down here to the finished audio files. So we have the tuned soprano, tuned alto, tuned tenor, and the tuned berry. And then those files get chopped up so that the parts can be aligned with each other. So you don't have a lot of notes being hit at different times. I didn't have to cut that up too much, which is a small testament to my ability to play along with the click. However, I do like it very tight, so I chop them up and nudge them here and there. The saxophone setup that I used, I'll show you that. Okay, the physical setup for recording the saxophones, I use two microphones, one to catch the bell and one placed on the side. This gives you full coverage of the instrument. I have these plugged into the console, the SX-1. 
didn't use a breakout box. I'm recording these in the studio control room. So just plugged them into channels one and two. And those are routed via ADAT to the Cubase workstation in the computer. Okay, now let me just play some of this. I'll solo the four finished tracks and I put a big reverb on it because I picture this being played in a in a giant hall. So it's a little soupy, but I think it sounds good that way. So let's have a listen to the first chorale. That's all I've recorded so far. As you can see, it's pretty labor intensive. There's a lot of takes to get about I'm not sure, maybe maybe a minute and 20 seconds of audio on four different instruments. So here is the first chorale for you. Now that's really fun. I'm going to record the remaining six as soon as I can over the period of the next week or so. I should be able to get all of this done. might not be exactly a week. I have the Pedal Giant Animals project going now and I'm rebuilding my studio computer because for the Paralandra four-part major work that I'm doing I needed to get better symphonic sounds and my computer just couldn't handle it. So I'm going to be using the Spitfire Albion uh, strings and woodwinds and percussion modules. So I'm building a new computer with the best board and the best processor I can get. And I'll be upgrading my Cubase to version 8, the latest, and going to a new sampling software using contact 5. Uh, all of this is going to take some physical work to put together the new computer and then a week no doubt of frustration as I get all the licensing transferred to a new computer and all the new software installed. I will do my best to keep these uh, backstage projects up to date though and I'm also considering the computer build as a, a separate project. I'll try to I'll try to create a video with that as it would not require the actual music software production suite to be working as I build it. Okay, that's it for this week's installment of the Bach 7 Corrals. Thank you very much for watching and stay tuned for part three. Listen to music. It will make you better.